Um, if you could put in the chat box who you are, where you're from, and while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we are going to talk about an introduction to North Carolina's Interdisciplinary Representation Program. I am Crystal Coble, and I will be your facilitator today. We do have a great presenter, Wendy Sotolongo, that will be sharing important information about this topic with us. So we're happy to have you here, and I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So a little bit about this webinar. It was made possible by funding from the North Carolina's Court Improvement Project, which is part of the Administrative Office of the Courts. It was also developed and presented by the Office of the Parent Defender and the Family and Children's Resource Program at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Social Work. So by the end of this webinar, uh, we are hoping that you walk away with knowing more about what the Interdisciplinary Representation Program is. And you may hear us say IRP. Uh, we also want you to know how it benefits families and children involved with the child welfare system, um, as well as um, those who work with them. So including attorneys, courts, child welfare agencies, GALs, and, and lots of other stakeholders, which we um, have you all here today. Also, how the IRP will be launched and expanded in North Carolina and what that looks like and what our plan is for that. And then lastly, uh, what to do if you want to know more, those next steps. So a little bit about our platform that we're using today to communicate with us. Many of you have already found the chat box. Uh, I do want to point out that in the chat box, uh, you'll see that there are options uh, in the top left corner. You'll see where it says everyone, and then right next to it, there's a plus sign. Uh, if you click on that plus sign, it will give you option of host, um, presenters, or selecting an inner individual. And this is how you can send a message to specifically if you wanted to send something to just the presenters or host. Uh, the primary way that we'll be uh, hearing from you today is through this chat box. So if you'll send messages and uh, you'll send them to everyone. And also if you could use this to send us your questions or comments. Uh, there are a lot of people here and I know that chat box is moving fast, uh, but we do have someone here in the background giving us support capturing those questions uh, to help keep track of them to make sure that we can uh, answer them as much as possible during our time here on the webinar together. So a little bit more about questions. I just mentioned that we're going to monitor them through the chat box uh, and answer them as much as possible throughout the webinar. So please feel free to uh, add them in there when you think of them. Uh, and Wendy will try to get to them as much as possible. And we will also have a section at the end that we have a pause, just in case you have any last minute questions that we hadn't gotten to. Also, a recording of this webinar uh, will be made available at this website. It's the SCRP website um, at UNC, and I'll share this link again towards the end of our time together. Um, so this is a way that you can listen to this again or a way that you can share it with other colleagues who may not have been able to be here. Uh, so that recording will be made available uh, on the website for sharing. One other feature about this platform that I want to point out to you uh, is to get our attention. In the, the top toolbar, you'll see a little a raised hand icon. If you click next to the drop-down box, uh, if you click on the drop-down box next to that, you'll see um, options for agree or thumbs up or applaud, laugh. You can uh, give us a little applause throughout. Um, and this also has options for speaking louder, speeding up, slowing down. Um, so those are other ways that you can communicate with us. Uh, so just to make sure everyone can access though, if you would give me a thumbs up using that icon that you have found that option and you can give us a thumbs up.
and we have a lot of people today, so we're going to see a, a lot of films. All right, so feel free to use those icons throughout our presentation today as you see fit. So again, I would like to welcome each of you uh, to today's webinar. My name is Crystal Coble, and I am from the Family and Children's Resource Program at UNC School of Social Work. I will be your moderator. Uh, we also have technical help from my colleagues, both Philip Armfield and John McMahon, that are helping in the background. And our presenter, who I know you all came to hear from, is Wendy Sotolongo, a parent defender at North Carolina Indigent Defense Services. And looking at the registrations, we have uh, judges, parent attorneys, DSS attorneys, uh, court and guardian ad litem staff here, uh, as well as others joining us today. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Wendy to introduce herself and then jump right into sharing about interdisciplinary representation. Thank you, Crystal. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and I appreciate all the work that you all have done. Um, there are a number of orders and thanks, uh, a number of thanks in order that I want to start with. And the, it, one is to the Court Improvement Program. They have uh, been instrumental in working to improve the child welfare court system in North Carolina. And one of one of their grants was given to the UNC School of Social Work in order to help develop this webinar and to work with me on getting this project off the ground. Um, I also want to thank the UNC School of Social Work. They've been an amazing uh, partner and collaborative um, team uh, in coming together, putting together these slides and setting up the webinar and getting all the invitations and registrations done. So thank you all so much for everything you've done. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, those of you that know me know that I have been wearing various hats in the child welfare court system for most of my legal career. Uh, next year I'll be had 35 years as a practicing attorney and the vast majority of that time has been in the child welfare courtroom. Um, I started off in Asheville with Pisgah Legal Services. Uh, but one of the things I did while I was there for my volunteer work was I actually was trained to be a guardian of item volunteer. So I started off a long time ago learning about that program. I next went to the Durham County Attorney's Office, in which my client was the Department of Social Services. So I wore that hat for nine years and was in court pretty much every week representing the department in these cases. I then went into private practice. And for the next seven years, I, had, uh, I was a solo practitioner um, and also uh, got a contract with the Durham Guardian of Lydon program to be their attorney advocate. Fifteen years ago, I was consider myself extremely fortunate to uh, be hired as Indigent Defense Services first parent representation coordinator. Since then, it's been changed to the statewide parent defender. And my you can see what the mission of our office is, and I will say that um, we, you know, I have been in this courtroom and, and worn a lot of different hats and really have, have thoroughly enjoyed being in this position trying to assist parent attorneys in doing, um, in really helping their clients through this system. So what we're here today to talk about interdisciplinary representation program that I am so excited that it's coming to North Carolina. And what it basically is in a nutshell is the pairing of a social worker with a parent attorney. And this is an independent social worker. This is not a DSS social worker. This is a, a will be part of the parent attorney team. Um, I, when I was in Durham practicing, I got a glimpse of how this worked because the Durham County Public Defender's Office, even back then, had heard about this model and hired a full-time social worker to be on their staff. The Durham Public Defender's Office has assistant public defenders representing parents in these cases, so they already had that team approach 
and I saw it be very successful in helping uh, parents access resources and, and really providing them some support. What I didn't realize at the time was that it really was a national phenomenon. And I found that out when I first when I went to my first National Parent Defense Conference in 2009, uh, sponsored by the American Bar Association, and just heard these remarkable stories from other states about all these wonderful things that were being done with <clears throat> interdisciplinary representation, sometimes called holistic model also, excuse me. So I was just really excited, and since that time, I've been wanting to try and figure out how we can bring this to North Carolina. Uh, we have on the call, I see, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, make her talk or anything. But Karen Johnson is here, and before she started with YFY um, as the YFS attorney for Mecklenburg County, she was a parent attorney, and she was a parent attorney with the Neighborhood Advocacy Council for quite a few years. And they also used this model where they had a full-time social worker on staff. So we've had it in pockets across the state, uh, but now we have an opportunity to really start bringing it statewide. <laughs> so as I said, in, in the nutshell, it is adding a social worker to the legal team. Um, again, it is a resource for, for the client and the attorney representing that client. The attorney is still the, in charge of the case, the legal case. Um, the social worker in these type, the model of representation is an agent of the attorney so that there is the confidentiality, the protection for the client. Uh, the big part of the interdisciplinary parent representation model is that there is shared responsibility and division of tasks. What I like to say is that, you know, I have picked up skills um, over the years that might be considered social worker skills, but I by no means am a social worker. And I know that social workers pick up a lot of information about the legal system, uh, but that doesn't make them lawyers. So what this allows the, this team to do is people really do their strengths. The attorneys can be attorneys. They can be doing discovery, filing motions, preparing witnesses for court, um, direct examination, cross-examination. And the social workers can do what they're excellent at, which is kind of um, advocacy, support, uh, investigation, for finding and accessing resources for their clients and encouraging their, their clients to, to participate meaningfully in those services. So I think it's a great model for that. There's a big part of it, of course, has to be ongoing team communication, um, that the, the parent attorney and the social worker really need to be keeping each other up to date frequently on what's going on with the client. Um, that's a big part of it. And one thing I really want to be clear about is, is the we do not, here in North Carolina, I know there's different versions of this model, but in North Carolina for this project, we do not see this independent, the IRP social worker, as being a court person. It is not a situation where we're going to have competing social workers getting on the stand and saying what they think the client should or should not do or the court should or should not do. It's not competing uh, expert witness um, it really is considered to be an out-of-court resource that it will help the parent to navigate the child welfare system and to, and to help the parent attorney represent that, their client um, by having an extra resource with which to, to, to help the client. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we really want to be clear up front that this is considered to be an out-of-court resource uh, that we really want to, to, you know, to have that as part of the model. And I also want to be very clear that this independent social worker who's part of the attorney team is no way replaces the agency caseworker. The agency caseworker is the primary caseworker DSS or whatever the um, local acronym is for the agency, they are the ones who are still in charge of the case. They are the ones who come up with the uh, family services plan, 
um, and they have all the responsibilities that they have. This is, again is an additional resource for the client. <clears throat> Why are, why do I feel like we need the, this model of representation? I'm going to start with the last bullet. I know that any of you who have worked with clients uh, who are part of the child welfare system have know the immense barriers that they face. The, um, you know, just, just speaking of issues of poverty, the, almost all of the clients are indigent. They have they have issues with having housing instability, employment uh, instability. They have transportation issues and unable to get to appointments, unable to get to service providers, unable to get uh, to to meet with their social worker. Um, and so that just right there are just innumerable barriers that call for a lot of attention and resources and advocacy. But then, of course, if they came to the attention of social services and the petition was filed, there's usually some additional aspects such as substance use, domestic violence, mental health issues. Um, so these can all really create just, just a, a lot of barriers for the parents to overcome. And I think the number one thing that they need is as much as much assistance as can possibly be given to them. We have the agency social worker who is doing their part in, in to ensure those services are provided. Uh, we have the parent attorney who's doing their part to advocate for the parent. And this is another very needed resource for the parents in order to help them succeed. So it does not, again, looking at the first two bullets, it doesn't say that the attorneys are not doing an adequate or good job and aren't competently representing their parent, their parent clients. It's just basically saying that this is there's some skill sets that we don't have, um, and there's also constraints on our time in terms of being doing a lot of this extra extra judicial activities, um, trying to find resources, trying to help find housing, try to help find transportation, things of that sort. And it's also not a reflection on what the agency worker is doing. It really is basically recognizing that the agency caseworker has a very different role. I mean, their role is one, they have a, they are state, um, they're government, and so they have a lot of rules and policies that they're always having to ensure are, are being complied with. And second, they have the entire family that is basically considered to be the client. So not only are they concerned about what is the children need, they're concerned about what both parents need, and they, then they have to look out for other relatives, non-relative kin. So they have a very, very uh, broad um, scope of responsibility, whereas the IRP social workers, in fact, in some ways, they're extremely fortunate and I think um, enjoy this aspect of this work is that they have a single client and their job is to really work in depth with that client and to, and to get that client the resources and the advocacy and assistance that they need to be successful. Um, there's a um, question I'll go ahead and answer, which is, can the social worker prepare a written report to be used in disposition or review hearing? I mean, the answer is they can. Our model will not be having that um, as a regular practice, because once you prepare a written court order, I mean, a written court report, a written report for court, then it really does become a court player. Then you, you're subject to being put on the stand for examination and cross-examination. So the idea is that this social worker really is doing work outside of court. There is ongoing frequent communication with all the parties involved outside of court so that there is good communication with the agency social worker, the volunteer guardian ad litem, um, and this, of course, as I already said, the the um, parent attorney. So um, any information that the IRP social worker obtains as part of their, their job, uh, most of that can be found, most of that can be introduced through other means. Uh, 
rather than having a court report or a witness. How is the defined role of the IRP social worker not in conflict with the parent attorney? I'm not sure I understand exactly. They are the same team. That IRP social worker, it works is part of the attorney's team, much like the attorney's paralegal is part of their team, or the attorney's legal assistant is part of their team, um, or if they secure the services of an expert witness, it is part of the parent attorney's team. So it, the parent attorney would be the one who's kind of making the legal decisions about the, the case in consultation with the client, um, and, the, and the IRP social worker is, is part of that that team. If, if that doesn't answer it, then maybe, maybe type in um, if you had a more specific question. And here's a quote that kind of, I think, helps to kind of understand what the, um, the role of it. And I have an example, and, and Karen, you're going to, I'm going to use one of your, one of Courtney, when Courtney was the social worker for the NAC in Charlotte, she came and spoke to our annual parent attorney conference, and she gave an example that I really think sheds some light on the differences. And Mecklenburg being near the South Carolina border, there was a relative placement in South Carolina that was interested in having placement, I think it was of the grandchild, and the client of Karen and Courtney was also in favor of having her child placed with her grandmother in South Carolina. But the ICPC was negative. Um, now at that point in time, most agency social workers, that's they, you know, they have done their job, they've done the ICPC and most will not go further on that. And there's that's absolutely I'm not having any concerns with that. But what I'm saying is that Courtney actually worked with the grandmother to address all the issues that caused that ICPC to be denied. Um, she was able to go a little bit further, dig a little bit deeper, and provide a little more individually tailored attention to the situation and got it to the point where the, all the concerns were, were rectified. And when the ICPC was, was redone, that the placement was approved and the child was able to be placed with that relative. Um, so I think that's a really good example of kind of just the, some nuanced differences between the different, the, the, what the IRP social worker can do. Um, the follow-up question on then is, if they're not in conflict with the parent attorneys, are they then in conflict with the DSS social worker? Uh, I think that, you know, we are not looking at this to be an adversarial relationship between the social workers. Again, we are, it is certainly the intent that the IRP social worker will be communicating closely with the agency social worker so that they can both work toward what they're, um, you know, to, to provide services to the family in order to be able to achieve permanency. Um, so I don't know that it's in conflict with the DSS social worker. Could there be times? Obviously, there's times when the parent attorney is going to be in conflict with the recommend, you know, the parent and their attorney are going to be in conflict with the recommendations of DSS in court. And at that point in time, the work that the IRP social worker has done is going to assist that parent attorney in advocating for the parent's position. But I don't think that we would want to start off by saying that there's always going to be an automatic conflict between um, the workers. So not only um, is it just a, a really excellent resource for the client parent and their parent attorneys, but it makes a difference. We have seen we have seen repeatedly through every, pretty much every study has shown that when you pair a social worker, independent social worker with a parent attorney and using an interdisciplinary model of representation, it achieves permanency faster for children. Uh, it, children come out of foster care faster. The, that is nothing but positive um, for, on many, many different levels. It also allows for creative arrangements for family time. I know 
just from kind of hearing what's going on across the state is that there's still a lot of counties that one hour a week is what is offered to a parent whose child has been removed in their custody. And that just simply is not sufficient in order to maintain the parent-child bond and also for the parent to kind of show their parenting skills and also um, just to make sure the child is has an understanding that their that their parent has not disappeared and that they are still there. So the IRP social worker in, is very instrumental in advocating and creating and looking for other ways for there to be family time. So we we know and, and they also are helpful in terms of really tracking down appropriate meaningful services that will that will lead to reunification. So we know that it's a good idea for as a resource for a parent. We know that it works and here are some some of the larger research studies that have shown that. Uh, Washington State is probably the gold standard of the of this practice. They have pretty much a statewide public defender system and so every one of their public defender offices has social workers on staff who are part of the attorney team and they have um, found that it really not only do reunifications occur faster but even when it doesn't go to reunification that another permanent plan adoption or guardianship occurs a year sooner than the average. A New York study was more recent and it's interesting there because they have most of their state is kind of like North Carolina where there's a lot of small firm and solo practitioners who are representing indigent respondents there. And then in the city area they have the large kind of legal aid organizations, the box the family defenders and, and um, children a CFR, Children and Family Representation Program. And so they did a study kind of comparing the two types of representation. And again, found that pregnancy was achieved a lot faster, reunification rates were higher. And really significant is that the, even though reunification occurred quick, faster, it was done safely. In fact, the children who, well, who returned home when the parent had had the assistance of an IRP social worker re-entered care at a lower rate than other families. So I think that it is successful on all different levels. Colorado is one of the more recent uh, states that has started this program and we're actually modeling ourselves after them. Um, they're a little bit ahead of us, but they have, what they're doing is they started off by hiring an MSW in the office that's equivalent to mine, the statewide public defender office, and then they started entering into contracts starting with a handful of counties. They did a, a study at the end of the pilot period to determine how the, it was going and found out that where they had the social work the independent social workers pair with the attorney that the reunification rates were nearly 22% higher and that the time in care was 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 less was there were much fewer days. So um, there's really not, not a single downside to this the, that when it's been implemented in other states. And so not only is it a good resource and not only is it um, really makes an impact, but it is recognized by the national organizations that uh, to be a best practice. So the American Bar Association has standards of practice for parent attorneys, and they are very clear that parent attorneys should engage or involve social workers part of their team. Um, the National Association of Council of Children, which uh, works with both attorneys for children and attorneys for parents recognizes as a best practice in child welfare cases as part of the um, high quality legal representation. And then this organization, which um, is doing a lot of really exciting work, the Family Justice Initiative is one of the first organizations that has really tried to pull together children attorneys and parent attorneys in order to ensure that 
both parents and children have access to high quality legal representation. And one of the things that they really encourage in their and um, in their work that they do is the interdisciplinary multidisciplinary practice model. So who is using these, and there's a question in the box, and I will get to that, about the supervision of visits. So um, if you can just hold on to that, we'll get to that. As I said, this is not kind of a radical idea. This is something that's been going on for a long time in a number of states. Okay, this is the third webinar that we've done on this, and this is the third time the train has come by. So it's, I'm not sure if we timed it that way or if the train timed it that way, but I apologize. Um, <clears throat> who is using these teams? A number of states are using them. I've talked about a few of them. In North Carolina, I mentioned that we do have the Durham Public Defender's Office has a full-time social worker. So also, the Scotland Hope County Public Defender's Office has a social worker on staff who actually previously was a CPS supervisor. Um, <clears throat> so there's pockets of, of this going on in North Carolina, and, but we have not been able to really scale it up. And we're going to talk about why we can do that now. And the reason that we can do that now is because we have been fortunate and successful in working with, um, let, me, let, me, sorry, let me back up, we are going to be drawing down some 4E funds <clears throat> to, to pay for this. And those of you who, who might not live and breathe 4E, 4E is the federal reimbursement funds that come from activities done to support children who are in foster care. And traditionally, it has been really, that money has only been accessible to the state DSS, or I'm sorry, the county DSS is state DSS. January of 2019, the policy change at the federal level, basically saying that attorney, um, I'm sorry, parent attorney organizations and child attorney organizations could begin to submit invoices for reimbursement of some of their costs in order to secure new funds. And the wonderful thing about it is this, these new funds cannot be used to replace existing funds so that they are actually new funds with which we can add new resources. So it took us over two years in negotiations with the state DSS to enter the MOU to be able to draw down these funds. We had, everyone had concerns. We wanted to ensure that we were billing for appropriate cases, that we were protecting the confidentiality of the client, that we're not infringing on the independence of the attorneys. So we had to really sort through a lot of issues. Um, but we just did recently sign it, and we will begin drawing down funds or getting some reimbursements in order to be able to do two things. The MOU says that we will do two things with the new money, and one of them is going to be increasing the rate of pay for parent attorneys, because IDS recognizes that it's woefully inadequate. Um, it, the rates were cut drastically a number of years ago, and they have not been restored in any way, shape. Even if they were restored fully, it would still not um, have kept up with the cost of living. So that is a priority of IDS, but we feel like even with a, um, rate, a rate increase that there will be extra money in order to start this project. So we are very excited about this, the idea of having some new money to start this. As I said, I think the first, as I said earlier, the first step is going to be hiring an MSW who will be an employee in my office. Again, as we go back to, I'm not a social worker. We have attorneys across the state who have dual degrees. I do not. So we will be relying upon the social worker to provide supervision to contract social workers um, and to, to help us get the program off the ground. The, um, the, the uh, 
Okay, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. I also wanted to recognize the fact that we will be partnering with the UNC School of Social Work in order to provide training to the social workers and also to the parent attorneys that will be participating in the program so that um, there will really be some ongoing learning about how we're, how we're going to be doing this program and really kind of addressing issues that we know will be coming up. So um, we will be hoping to start hiring that MSW soon. Once the MSW is in place, we'll be uh, looking to select which the counties are going to which counties are going to start off the initial cohort, and then hiring uh, entering into contracts with social workers in that county in order to have act, for the attorneys to have access to the social workers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute how that works. So what will the IRP social workers do? Uh, they'll basically have three roles. They will have the role of support, investigation, and advocacy. And some of the examples you see here are what, the, what it might look like for IRP social worker to provide support to a parent. Um, and then also what they might do in terms of them being investigating some of the case. It is, you know, it is certainly difficult for a parent attorney to find sufficient time to really go out and interview any potential uh, neighbors for witnesses or uh, kin or non or, or non-relative kin or relatives in order to assess possibility of, of providing placement or support for the client. And that's something that the social worker can do. You know, we hear a lot about child and family team meetings, and is if so, if attorneys start showing up, it really changes the flavor of those meetings, which are meant to be kind of service oriented. Um, and in places where this model is in place, the social worker, the independent social worker, attends those meetings and is there as an as a resource, an advocate for the parent, um, and able to kind of help them through that process without it becoming something where all the attorneys are involved. And as an advocate, so I mean again at the when you're in the at these meetings where they're trying to determine what the services the parent needs to do to safely reunify with their child, you know, this social worker is able to kind of advocate um, and on behalf of the parent and with the parent's voice to, to really ensure that they are tailored, the services that, that are agreed upon are tailored to the needs of the client. So there's, um, we really anticipate that they will have frequent, regular, ongoing, collaborative relationships with the other court partners and that are involved in the parent's case. That would be the agency social worker, that would be the guardian ad litem. Um, that would be the service providers, uh, and all of that under the umbrella of the parent attorney. Um, so those three roles. And in all of those roles, I'm answering one of the questions here, does the home study done by the IRP overrule the home study done by the CS, DSS social worker? No. Um, and in all of these roles, Really, we are looking at, again, this is not a competing expert. Um, it is, there, home studies, the IRP social worker will not be conducting official home studies, per se. As an example, it would be, okay, there's a grandmother who lives in the county, and she's interested in having her child, her grandchild placed with her. The IRP social worker can go there first and say, well, it's really clear that this is, house is not childproof. It's really clear that, you know, there's this issue of broken window or whatever that's going to present a barrier and can work with the grandparent to get that type of stuff resolved even before the DSS social worker comes over to conduct the kind of um, official home study. So, again, it is not something where the IRP social worker is preparing their own home studies. That's not the role. It's not the role of the IRP social worker to prepare their own court reports. They are an outside of the court resource 
for the parent and the parent attorney. So I hope I answered that question. Um, if not, again, please feel free to, to put follow-ups in the chat. Um, so getting back to what our model is going to look like, what we're going to start with is a, number, a small number of counties um, that we hope to have several social workers on contract in those counties. We know that regardless of what we start with, it's not going to be enough. So we are going to have to put some parameters on the, the request. So when an attorney in a county that's been selected would like to have the resource of a social worker, they will basically be completing a very brief application, kind of setting forth um, and, you know, the request so that we can have a record of it. Uh, in that case, we will not be taking requests from cases where there's allegations of abuse. And, of course, that doesn't eliminate a lot since most of the cases are uh, neglect and dependency allegations only. But we'll also not be taking cases where DSS is alleging aggravated circumstances and not asking and asking to be relieved of unification from the get-go. So we are um, uh, want the plan to be unification, and we really want these to come in early. It is really hard to come in when the case has been going on for a year and try to kind of come in and provide that resource. It's just much more effective. Uh, and just has much better results when the social worker is involved early on, certainly before the initial disposition. So that would be something that we would be looking at in terms of when requests come in and what, where the state, where the case is at, what stage it's at. I'm sorry, it sounds like my audio may be breaking up, and I apologize for that. The um, so that is where we're going to be starting. And of course, part of this, as I mentioned earlier, is that we have to sh we want to look at how how it works in North Carolina. We have seen that We have seen that in other states, whenever they have implemented this practice model, that it has really helped um, kind of change the trajectory of cases and quicker permanency and higher reunifications. And so we need to measure that as well. So we are, um, in addition to having this contract or this agreement with the USC School of, School of Social Work to provide training and support for the social workers involved in this program. And we've also, CIP has, has given a grant to IDS for IDS to develop an online reporting system so that all the attorneys involved in these programs, uh, in this model, and the social workers will be entering some data. Because we'll be looking at things like, you know, does, do, if the social worker isn't involved, is there, what, is there a difference in how much family time or visitation is is going on? Is there is permanency being achieved quicker as we found in other states? So we'll need to be measuring those. So we're going to be working to have that along with the um, with the training to really provide a lot of robust support and 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 oversight of this project. And another part of the oversight will be from Court Improvement Program. They are putting together an advisory group, uh, and the advisory group is going to include DSS attorneys, DSS directors, um, guardian ad litem, representatives, um, in, in, judges. In, in, what we really want is a, for people who are in the courtrooms to be able to help us work through the questions that we know are going to arise, such as, you know, um, how this whole bar about attending court, participating in court proceedings, things like that, how we work those out. So it would be really great if any of you are interested that you could let us know if that's something you'd like to be part of as the advisory group as we get this um, project off the ground and then as we hope to expand it to a statewide project. So what are the next steps? This is step one. You, you've, if, 
um, this is going to be a parent attorney driven model which means that the parent attorneys who are interested in bringing this to their county as a resource for their parent bar will be the ones who will be um, taking the initiative to, to come to the next step, which is a webinar for interested parent attorneys. And we're offering that twice. And we're going to dive a little deeper into what the role of the social worker will be with the parent attorney and what the answer questions specific to the parent attorneys um, perspective on this. And then after that, we'll be looking to parent bars in different counties to, to indicate their um, interest in being participating in this in, at the early stage. We will be looking for the court partners to, to provide letters of support and indicate that they are interested and, and willing to kind of collaborate with getting this project off the ground in their county. Uh, we'll be contemporaneously with that, we'll be recruiting social workers um, to, to build the contracts. Um, and then we will start having our trainings for the attorney social worker teams. And then there'll also be trainings um, for the social workers separately uh, so that they can really, really learn from each other and kind of become a learning community. Um, a couple of questions before I think I turn it back over after this. Oh, wait, there's one more. Oh, I did talk about the evaluation and that we will be looking toward collecting that data and having those um, research um, reports done on the data that's collected in terms of what our outcomes are. And we here are the specifics about the this next steps. And I will say, um, and I think Crystal will give more information about this, is that you know, if, if you do think this is something that your county might be interested in, that this webinar will be available to, um, to listen to for the attorneys that weren't able to make it. Um, if so a couple questions here. I'll try to get at least the initial thoughts on them. And again, this is a this is a process. We're bringing this model to North Carolina. We're going to be working through a lot of this. And these questions are really what we need from you all for us to kind of help figure out what we need to work through and what we need to figure out. So the question is, is if the IRP social worker is going to have contact with the DSS social worker and GAL and other service providers, won't that be documented information that finds its way in the DSS and GL reports? What if that documentation is incorrect? How is it corrected if the IRP social worker can't testify or submit reports? And that's an excellent question, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I think that I just have a number of answers that come to my head, so I'm trying to figure out is that um, Yes, obviously it will become documented because the agency social worker has to document on their contacts. And so if they're having contact with the IRP social worker, then that will come in. Um, same with the GL report. You know, I, uh, you know, ideally you're in a county where you get the court reports early. And you're, that certainly is something that should be happening across the state at this point where you get to see those reports well before court and can really kind of address any inaccuracies in there. If it is an inaccuracy that cannot be resolved before the court hearing such that the report is amended with the correct information, then that might be a situation in which the um, IRP social worker has to testify. I, I'm not saying that they will never testify. I'm saying that we're going to try and avoid it because we will want it. It changes a little bit of their um, it's like having a therapist having to produce their notes. I mean, it changes the relationship of that of that resource with the parent. And to um, it, it will cost. We will still be paying a social worker by the hour to sit in court and wait in order to testify. And that is certainly not, we don't think, the best use of the funds to be able to do that. So will they testify sometimes? Yes. Is that hope something that we hope to avoid? Yes. Um, another question, so many of our issues in, in our area involve substance use by parents and resources are scarce. 
I don't see enough resources for meaningful treatment. Would the social worker attorney work toward more resources in the area of substance abuse? That is a excellent question. Um, I don't necessarily see that as the role of the social worker in this situation. I, but I do see that as everybody's responsibility uh, in that if you're in a county that is, has a lack of meaningful resources, whether it's substance use or another type of treatment, that um, we really, really need to work together as a team to, to advocate somehow for those resources to come to the county. So the social group could be able to give information about, you know, percentages of cases involving it and the barriers that their clients are creating, but they're not going to necessarily be the ones who are going to be able to create new resources. I wish we could. I wish all of us had that ability. Um, I hope I covered most of the questions here. And again, I really appreciate all of you attending this. I really appreciate your your listening, and I uh, really appreciate your questions. Um, and I think I will send this back to Crystal. All right. Thank you, Wendy. So just a short recap of next steps uh, for parent attorneys. As Wendy mentioned, this is a parent attorney driven model and process. Uh, so the first step is being here. And we also, again, are having this recorded. So if, if you need to share this with other uh, other parent attorneys. Um, and then the next step, which I will give instructions on how to do how to uh, sign up for is a parent attorney webinar and we're offering those on September 23rd and 24th um, and the expectation is that before you come to that webinar um, you will either have attended this event or listen to the recording um, and the way that you apply for that webinar is to sign up for the mailing list um, using the link that you see here to express interest in participating uh, and then we will be sending out uh, the information for the webinar on the 23rd and the 24th um, to that mailing list. Uh, so again, you'll need this to sign up to show interest, and the, then we will share information via this uh, list listserv for next steps. Um, I do want to, well, we're giving Wendy a breath, a moment before we go back to see if there's any additional questions. Uh, we did have someone mentioned requesting the slides. So I do want to go ahead and share those with you as well as one other resource. So you'll see that I have moved over onto the slides of File Share Pod. And on here, the first document that you will see here that you can download um, are the slides for this webinar and they are in PDF form. So you can download them there. And then you also see the second document that is there is an article that we have included that we feel like uh, can be helpful in providing additional information. Uh, there is uh, other information and resources out there. Uh, this is one that we pulled that we feel like would be helpful. Uh, but again, there is other information related to um, other models and evaluations in other states. Uh, but please start with this one uh, because it, it may uh, answer some of your initial uh, thoughts about the use of adding social workers to uh, representation teams. So I will leave this here so that you can access and uh, download those materials. And then once again, we uh, will put up the, I'll put up the link for how to access the uh, webinar once it is posted. Uh, the webinar recording, once it is posted, uh, will be on our FCRP UNC uh, website. Uh, so again, if you have additional questions, we do still have a few minutes, um, and I'm sure Wendy would be willing to answer those. Thank you, Wendy, for bringing this wonderful information uh, to us. You've done a really great job doing this uh, webinar three times. So <laughs> please, if there's any other questions, type them in the chat pod, and uh, we'll get to them uh, momentarily.
Thank you. Uh, one question that came up in the previous webinars and just touch on it is what are we looking for in terms of the social workers? And and we are not, we would not be requiring MSWs um, for this position. That is not, the, the only MSW we, requirement would be in my office and to be able to provide the supervision that we want. The uh, We are hoping to be flexible in terms of both part-time and full-time contracts. And I think that we would get some really great social workers who have agency experience who might be retired but still want to work part-time or agency social workers who don't want to work full-time anymore because they may have young children or other familial responsibilities. So it is, um, the question is, have you seen DS social workers apply? And the answer is absolutely. In um, fact, that there's a, as I mentioned earlier, in some ways, it's just that the social workers love that the aspect of really being able to focus on one person and really help them navigate the system um, without a lot of the kind of just rules and regulations and policies and other considerations that, that agency social workers have to face all the time. So, um, but that being said, we would not require uh, these contract social workers to have agency experience. Um, in fact, we would probably at some point be looking toward having social work students also being able to help provide who are working toward their degrees. So we, these are kind of the things that we are continuing to assess and that's certainly one of the reasons I love having a partnership with the UNC School of Social Work because again they, they know what um, kind of what training will be needed and they'll be able to fill to fulfill that to fulfill that role, so. All right, so it looks like uh, Karen Johnson has graciously offered, if um, anyone has a questions, uh, she can offer her expertise um, and she has included a way to reach her. Uh, so thank you, Karen. Um, I have two last requests. Uh, so again, we mentioned that this um, webinar and your questions actually is also helpful for us in hearing what some of your questions are as we think through, you know, continuing to look at what this model will look like in North Carolina. Um, so if you would, uh, types in the chat pod one thing that you learned today that you'd like to hear more about, um, or if there are any other questions you have, because again, that is helpful for us as we continue uh, to move forward. Thanks, Karen. I appreciate that. You really, you, you guys were a wonderful team. You and Courtney, when you had this practice model, this model of representation going on. Um, so I appreciate you being available as a as a resource. Uh, Jeff, yeah, I would think it could easily be full time work. We have had social work programs reach out to us. Uh, uh, already expressing interest for it to being a placement uh, for their students. And so that is, again, something that we have on our to-do list is to be looking into that. And as you all are continuing to type any of your last thoughts or questions into the chat pod, I want to say thank you again to Wendy and um, this vision and passion and bringing this to North Carolina. You'll see her contact information here. And then I will close with just thanking you for your participation today, everyone. I, I love seeing so many people from across our wonderful state of North Carolina. Yes, thank you so much.